Hello. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, very good. You are ready for the revolution. <laughs> okay, okay, y'all get A's, that's good. Thank you so much for joining us. We are ripping through European history and art for travelers. This is the third hour of a three-part series. We've gone from the Middle Ages through the Gothic Age. That was 900 years in an hour. And then we went from 1400 to 1800. That was the Renaissance and the Baroque Age in an hour. And now we're kicking off the tumultuous last two centuries of European history and art for our travel needs. It is so important when we travel to understand what we're looking at. And boy, in the last 200 years in Europe, there's been lots going on. So thank you very much for uh, joining us. And right now, we're gonna take about an hour to go from the French Revolution, the late 1700s, up until our generation. And I want to uh, remind you once again of the ridiculousness of covering this much ground in 60 minutes. So I'm gonna be sweeping over things. I'm gonna make gross generalizations. I'm gonna rough up and ball park things, but what I want to do fundamentally is give you a handle on the most important aspects of European culture so that when you travel, you can check them out. All the details are in our guidebook, Europe 101 History and Art for Travelers, and right now, we're going to talk about how Europe made this very, very complicated and painful change from the Middle Ages into the modern world, from the age of the divine monarch into the age when people are liberty, equality, and fraternity. This notion that we are our own masters. That was quite a change, and it took a big revolution. This, these two paintings kind of sum it up. You've got this notion of divine monarchs, and you've got Napoleon on a horse taking the ideals of the ref revolution into a viable future. We've got a huge generation gap when we think of the people of the uh, Divine Monarch Age and the Baroque Age and their children in this new Age of Reason, the Enlightenment, where everything is subjected to the test of reason. When we think about the revolution, we're talking about a society that really was stepping into a brave new future and challenging this guy, Louis XIV. Louis XIV, the King of France, was the embodiment of the old regime notion that some people are born to be rulers and the rest of us just need to follow the rules, okay? This was sort of the huge gap between rich and poor that Europe put up with and the in elites and the royalty and the people that supported them were able to pull this off using art as propaganda, having the church on their side and keeping people unable to get their hands on information. It was a very impressive lock on power and it took a lot to tear it down. When you have that divine monarch, you have to impress upon your people that God really is ordaining you to rule without question and you can't do that without a fancy house. And Louis had the ultimate palace in Europe, Versailles. This was sort of the textbook example of a Baroque king, a divine monarch king's house, and other kings emulated him. Now, as this elite society got more and more fabulously powerful and rich, they retreated more and more from reality. And as you get this divide between fewer and fewer people getting richer and richer and more and more people getting poorer and poorer, you're going to get rumblings in the street. The kings didn't even want to hang out at Versailles. That was where all of their you know, elites would party. They moved into the park, into the garden. And Marie Antoinette you know, and, and Louis would go further and further away until the palace retreat of the palace retreat of the palace retreat was buried deep into their fantasy land, and that was Marie Antoinette's Petit Hameau, the Little Hamlet, where the queen would tend her perfumed sheep in her manicured gardens, and her people would tell her everything's okay. They'd tell them, the people are hungry in Paris, she'd say, let them eat cake. Let them eat cake didn't mean, I was always confused by that, it didn't mean like a, a piece of cake, it meant the, the, the throwaway stuff, the crust in the bakery. When they're eating that, when, they, when they've eaten that and if they're still hungry, then let them come to me and I'll help them out. It was that disdain for the people that was just too much. And in the streets of Paris, they rumbled and they gathered and they charged onto Versailles and they literally took the king and queen 
under house arrest into the city and eventually cut off their heads. This was the physical sort of symbolic ending of the old regime, and that was the Great Revolution, the Liberal Revolution, the French Revolution, 1789, around there. When you think of the revolution, I want to review the different elements of the pie and how re-slicing the pie leads to this violent revolution. Throughout the feudal ages, you've got three parts in the pie. And to me, there's this fixed pie tin. All that stuff in there has to be divided up with the people. How you do that shapes society. And when you re-slice the pie, that is what causes history. And not much happened, relatively speaking, in lots of the Middle Ages because everybody was stuck with or satisfied with their slice of the pie. You had three slices, the nobility and the landowners. You had the clergy and the church that controlled the uh, religious power and the intellectual power, and you had everybody else who were the peasantry, the landless peasants. When the city folk came along, they put them into that third estate, and that's what that caused the ruckus, because now the third estate was more than just a bunch of uneducated, illiterate, superstitious, you know, unwashed peasants. Now you had smart people, you had educated, rich people that demanded respect, and they demanded a chance to re-slice that pie, and they got it. They got it, and it was violent, and that was the French Revolution. Now, when that was all said and done, you made room for the city folks, and then later on, you had the peasantry of the city, the proletariat, and you sliced that pie again, and that was the social revolution of the Bolsheviks and our modern age, and today we have a situation which is much different than what they came with out of the French Revolution. Thinking about the French Revolution, we go to Paris, we see so many sites that relate to that, and we can imagine what it was like with the king and the queen being held hostage, and then eventually paraded up the street and made what they call a foot shorter at the top, <laughs> meeting the national razor. Now this was a brave new age when they cut off the head of the king and the queen, and what came out of that was a very stark, cerebral, revolutionary, enlightened society. Everything was subjected to the test of reason. For the first time, respected elements were standing up and not just saying the church is wrong, they were saying religion doesn't make sense at all. Uh, everything had to be logical. During the French Revolution, churches were turned into temples of reason. During the French Revolution, they said 365 days in the year, except when there's leap year, and 30 days has so-and-so and 31, and February is 28 or 20. That's all silly. We need 12 30-day months. And then there's five or four days at the end of the year where everybody will not do anything except help the state. And each of those 30-day months has three 10-day weeks. Now, that's logical, and that's what they had in the French Revolution. Everything was that kind of, we're going to start over and we're going to do it smart. Nothing was immune, and it was really an amazing time. The art of this period was neoclassical, and we see that when we go to Paris. Great structures that feel old, but really feel new. They're just 200 years old. You've got the Arc de Triomphe. You've got all sorts of great, classically inspired buildings that came in the early 1800s. You've got statuary that is pure and ideal. This is Canova or the great Danish sculptor Torvaldsen. Beautiful neoclassical statues. You've got neoclassical themes that celebrate great, you know, ancient th stories, like here's the death of Socrates. When you think of Napoleon coming out of the French Revolution, this crazy revolution got so wild that, you know, it got more and more extreme, and, and finally they cut off the head of Robespierre. I mean, it went, you could, get, it's like there's a window of political conceivability. There's only so much wit that a society can handle. And as it moves left or right, what used to be loony becomes fringe. What used to be fringe becomes that side. What used to be that side becomes the middle. What used to be loony here becomes inconceivable. It moves that way. And then people that weren't heard are now heard. And they wave their flags and they say, cut off their heads and it goes further. And those loonies say, wave your flag, cut off their heads, and, and these people are Anybody s suspected of showing insufficient patriotism, that was grounds enough to cut off your head. If you, were subject, if you were suspected of showing insufficient patriotism, it was called the terror, and this was took over France. All the nobles and the, and the old regime people fled to other countries, 
And then all those countries declared war on France, and out of that came the Napoleonic Wars and so on. It, just an amazing time. Well, the revolution got going so far, it went so wild, they actually cut off the head of Robespierre, and then there were people starting to rethink it. And the king was out here, and he's saying, I want back, the king's heir was over here. He says, I want back in the throne, and when I get back in the throne, heads are really going to roll. What an amazing time. So the revolutionary people realized, we're going to lose this thing. We've got to either go back to the king or give it to the military. And they thought, is there a charismatic leader of the military, uh, a hero of the revolution, a short guy that keeps his hand in his, in his coat like this? Napoleon, perfect guy. So Napoleon was given reins of the government, and Napoleon now has un, you know, the most populous, most powerful country in Europe, unbridled with the old privilege and the idea that rich kids get the positions of power. Now it is talent, and it is for a cause. It is liberty, equality, fraternity. This is the brave new world, and France is leading Europe into that. I'm a sucker for that. When you see Les Miserables and so on, it's just amazing to think of the courage of these young intellectuals, in a lot of cases, that helped bring the rest of the world, uh, rest of the Western world, into the modern age. I want to stress, it's not just the, French, the revolution of 1789. There were several after that. It took a long time, and there was a lot of craziness, and finally, it all came out, and the result of it all was a compromise. It was a constitutional monarch who went to work every day, not in leotards and a wig, but with a briefcase. And that's what, what came out of the revolution, all that chaos, something that was modern and viable and reasonable. When we think of Napoleon, he was crowned emperor. He wanted to be king. He wanted to be the king of France, but you couldn't do that because that was unrevolutionary. But what was revolutionary is being the emperor. So Napoleon was emperor. And he got crowned where the French kings got crowned, but he didn't want to be in a Gothic church because that was medieval. And that's what they're trying to get beyond. He masked the medieval columns with Roman-style pilasters. And he crowned himself emperor, not king. So he's powerful, but it is this new notion of power that came out of the Reformation. You can see this canvas of Napoleon's coronation. It's the biggest canvas in the Louvre, and it's something you don't want to miss. Remember, all across Europe now you have this neoclassical art. In England, there's a lot of neoclassical art, but it's called Georgian art. Named after the king who was on the throne then, easy to remember because it was King George that the Americans were fighting, and the art of that age in England is called Georgian. Here we have the British Museum in London, a beautiful example of a Georgian facade. Here in the town of Bath, two hours west of London, you have a Georgian um, uh, condominium complex, and this is where the elite of that society would buy beautiful homes, and they all got this beautiful Georgian uniform purity, this neoclassical elegance. Coming out of the age of revolution and the neoclassical art, that got so extreme that people wanted to let their hearts off their leash, and they wanted a response to that, and it's this pendulum that swings back to the romantic side, and the next movement is called romanticism. It's very interesting, the pendulum, when you think about it. So often it goes from cerebral to emotional. Think about it in European history. It doesn't go cerebral, cerebral, emotional, emotional. It always swings back and forth. For instance, Gothic is quite emotional, and then Renaissance is quite cerebral. And after Renaissance, you've got Baroque, which is intentionally emotional. And then after that, after so much of Rococo and all that kind of stuff, you've got the Enlightenment and the French Revolution and Neoclassicism. And then after that, and turning temple, churches into temples of reason and all that, the pendulum swings back and we've got the Romantic Age. Now, people just are tired of all this cerebral business and they want to underline their medieval and their Christian heritage and they want to do things in a neo-Gothic way. It's amazing, this back and forth that you see in your travels. When we think of romantic art, and romantic, romanticism really is the ism of the 1800s. Romantic art is not kissy, mushy, flirtatious art like we would think in the modern sense of romantic. Romantic is just emotional. A good example of that is The Raft of the Medusa by Jericho. Now, The Raft of the Medusa is an intentionally emotional, romantic theme. It was a terrible event, a ship went down, there was cannibalism, it was a terrible thing, the survivors on the raft, and here they are in despair, people dead, 
people giving up, and it works up to this powerful pyramid of hope. And there's a man waving a rag up on the top of all these people, and in the distance, tiny, tiny on the horizon, is the mast of a ship that may or may not rescue them. What a romantic painting. And that would be a great example of the spirit of romanticism. A wonderful romantic painter is Goya. Goya, who painted in Spain, and uh, you'll see a lot of his art in Madrid. Goya started off a pretty light romantic painter, but he was a painter with a political edge. He painted the royal family, because that was his bread and butter, and he painted them looking kind of goony, because they were kind of goony, and he got away with it somehow. Goya witnessed the first modern armies and the consequences of that. The army of the Napoleonic Age was the levy en masse. It was all hands on deck. Everything was for the state, and the French created this biggest ever assembled army, and it was able to go and mow down patriots in other countries with all the compassion of a lawnmower. Look at those soldiers there in lockstep, intentionally faceless, as, as there's a whole line of patriots that are going to be shoved in front of the firing squad and killed. One after another. This is the 3rd of May by Goya. And you see these patriots meeting their death and ending up a rumpled heap on the ground. That's romanticism. And remember, romanticism has a natural affinity for the patriotic underdogs, the ethnic uh, Cinderella stories, gypsies, Indians, um, any sort of national cause that's against a big emperor, that's going to have a romantic sort of a, a partnership. Uh, Goya finished his life just sort of crazed in a depressed gloom in his house, literally painting on his walls, kind of finger painting with his own blood in a sense. And these are his dark stage paintings. And you'll see mankind slamming away each other as he has seen these modern armies that are unprecedented. And, uh, and then there's a very famous painting by Goya called Saturn Devouring His Son, which is symbolic of time eating us all. Again, very, very emotional, very romantic in that way. Another dimension of romanticism, which I think is quite powerful, is this love of nature. When we think about romanticism in the 19th century, in a lot of ways, it's losing yourself in the awesomeness of nature. And this is a first in art history. Now we have artists being inspired by the wilds. A part of the daily academic diet of every scholar at Oxford and Cambridge was to walk in the woods and commune with nature. Now, when people made a pilgrimage to cultural big shots, they weren't going to some fancy salon in Paris. They were going up to the Cumbrian Lakes District in the north of England and walking in the woods with the great poet Wordsworth. Turner is a great romantic uh, uh, landscape artist, and he would paint seascapes, and he would paint landscapes that really pull you in to the wonder of nature. When you go to the Lake District in northern England, that's where you find the power of nature in such a beautiful way. You'll find more youth hostels per square mile in the Cumbrian Lakes District than anywhere else in Europe, for, and they need every one of them because the English people love to go up there and commune with nature. This is the backyard of Wordsworth, the great poem poet. And you can see his home there, you can read his poetry there, and you can be inspired by the romantic movement and how that involved nature. Along with nature, remember, romanticism is the natural partner of patriotic spirit when it comes to nationalism. Romanticism and nationalism, they're together. In the 1800s, the other ism along with romanticism was nationalism. Should there be a German state? Should there be an Italian country? Should Norway be part of Sweden? Should the Bulgarians be free from the Ottomans? All of these were romantic causes warmed up intellectually in romantic circles, intellectual circles, and then becoming politically reality. Robert Burns was a great romantic poet and novelist who popularized the notion that Scotland should be a proud group, a proud nation. And he did a lot to reawaken the spirit of the Scottish people. Our notion of Scotland today pretty much created by Robert Burns in the 1800s, even though we think it's much older than that. When we go to Norway, for instance, I love to go to the National Gallery in Oslo before going into the wilds of the fjords, because in the National Gallery, I can see how great Norwegian painters painted their natural wonder in an over-the-top romantic style, how connected it is with the soul of Norway. 
when we go to any country in Europe, if you go to the National Gallery, look at the 19th century paintings, and there we get this romanticized notion of those people. I was just in Berlin filming in the uh, uh, old National Gallery where they have all of the romantic paintings that show the Germans idealizing their country before it was made into a country to sort of legitimize it. These paintings to me really are powerful comments on the folk culture and how powerful and legitimate that is. It's no coincidence that in the 1860s, the United States was fighting our civil war, struggling over the notion, should be we be one nation, indivisible, or should we be two nations? And we went to war, wondering what we are, and we decided we are one nation. At the same time, Italy was struggling to become one nation. In the same decade, Germany was going against everybody's wishes and forging that nation. At the same time, Norway was distinguishing itself from the Swedes, Bulgarians, gypsies, everybody was making their move. It was an exciting time. The musicians of the age championed the romantic causes. I just love it. When you go to Norway, you go to the fjords, and you can hear the music of Edvard Grieg. And then you go to Trolltagen, where Grieg lived, and you go to the little hut where he had his piano, and he was inspired by the view out the window. You see how the, the soul of Norway is in the fjords, and it shows through in the music of Edvard Grieg. I had the great privilege and creative uh, challenge and delight of producing a one-hour TV show called Europe, A Symphonic Journey, right here in this room. And we had our local symphony right here, and a lot of travelers out here, and we chose seven different countries in Europe, and we celebrated their national emotional anthems, not a national anthem in the Pledge of Allegiance uh, sort of sense, but a national anthem in a sense of Aaron Copeland makes me feel great as an American. Svetana feels make me feel great as a Czech. Wagner makes me feel great as a German. And, you know, uh, Strauss makes me feel really good as an Austrian. Grieg makes me feel Norwegian. All of those were celebrated. We played the great hit, and then we uh, cut in all sorts of beautiful images from those countries and put it together in a very tight hour. It's a beautiful hour with our symphony and with all the archive of images we have from our TV show, beautifully edited by my crew, and you can watch it anytime for free at ricksteves.com. So if you want just a, an appreciation of romanticism as a champion of nationalism with music in the late 1800s, go to ricksteves.com and listen to Europe, a symphonic journey. I just love going to the Czech Republic and seeing the work of Muka, the Slavic epic. And there you got a classic example of the triumph of the Czech people. Imagine surviving as a little tiny nation between Germany and Russia over the centuries. How do they do it? It's a quite, a, quite a triumph, and you see that in the Romantic art. Now, during the middle of the 1800s, again, we have no Germany, we have no Italy, and we have Europe pretty much run by big families. Eventually, at the end of World War I, all of the big families are going to be gone. No more Ottoman uh, sultans, no more Romanovs, no more Habsburgs, and so on. All of those big families are going to be history, and we're going to end that concept of the divine monarch. But it's going to take still a little while. When we think about Italy uniting, none of the existing powers wanted a new power, but Italians knew that there was the case to be made for one nation where everybody who speaks Italian is together. And they made it. It's a fascinating story. By 1870, Italy was essentially the Italy we know today. Okay? They had said, famously, now we've made Italy, our next step is to make Italians. It was really tough to get people to relate to Italy because they have such strong regional loyalties, but you have that beautiful country of Italy created only in 1870. The same thing in Germany. Germany was not existing, nor was Italy in 1850. There was 15 or 20 different states there. Remember, when we do our sightseeing, we're looking at the crown jewels and the palaces and the White Houses and so on of countries that don't, do no longer exist. Bavaria was a moderate power ruled for 600 years by the Wittelsbach family. Today, that's long gone as Germany has been united. Of course, when Germany was united, all of a sudden, you've got a new player in the game. And with Germany united, you've got a superpower, and everybody else has carved up the world from a colony point of view, and Germany's scrappy, get out there, whatever colonies they can, that created a tension. People didn't want that. 
they worked against it. I think in Germany they had a, a sort of an inferiority complex and a lot of the art during the German unification movement was art that delves deep into the mythical past to make Germany legitimate. Just like we had Paul Bunyan and just like England had uh, King Arthur, Germany would have these characters from their mythic past that said, yes, there should be a Germany. There may not be a political unit called Germany today, but it's the truth and the truth will prevail. In 1870, they put together Germany. Now, some of the romantic art we see in Germany is, for instance, Neuschwanstein Castle. When you look at Neuschwanstein, it looks medieval, but it is neo-medieval. Remember, half of all the most pointy medieval stuff that you see, it's probably done in over-the-top neo-medieval style in the late 1800s. For years, I went to this castle, this famous Disney castle in southern Germany, and I thought it was medieval. It's pointy. And then I learned what romanticism is. I learned about Mad King Ludwig. That's his popular name for tourists. Mad, he's King Ludwig II of Bavaria. And I learned that his best buddies were opera composers like Wagner. Entire rooms in his castle were modeled after Wagnerian opera themes. When you look at the wallpaper in these places, you're going to find all sorts of knights in shining armor. It was just this nostalgic, fanciful look back at the medieval past. That's romanticism, and in a way it justifies Germany in this case. Remember, when you're sightseeing around Europe, when you see something very pointy, like Mad Ludwig's castle, like the castle here in Segovia, outside of Madrid, like the skyline in Bruges, or like the pointy church in Prague, or like the halls of parliament in Big Ben in London. This is very likely romantic done in the middle or late 1800s, in an over-the-top faux medieval style. It would be neo-Gothic or neo-Romanesque. There's a whole art stage here called historicism, which is just neo-everything. In the late 1800s, neo-Renaissance, neo-Baroque, neo-Gothic, it's all this late 1800s building that goes back to their heritage. Here's the cathedral in Berlin, made in the late 1800s, looking pretty old to me, but done in an over-the-top style. During this period, we also have the Industrial Age. And with the Industrial Age, we got the train lines of Europe being laid. We've got all sorts of iron and steel happening. This is the very first iron bridge. This was built in 1776 in England. It's the Iron Bridge Gorge, considered the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution. When we think of the Industrial Revolution, what comes out of that is Industrial Age art, like the Eiffel Tower. When you look at the Eiffel Tower, that was 100 years after the French Revolution, built to celebrate the French Revolution, 1879. And uh, all over Europe, you'll find similar kind of buildings that look Eiffel-esque. Here's a mini stubby Eiffel Tower in the resort town of Blackpool in England. That was just, they had an erector set and they wanted to use it. <laughs> they built a lot of these things intending to take them down. They built the Eiffel Tower fully expecting to build it on a schedule, celebrate a, that it was there, and then take it down on a schedule. They got it all the way built, and they decided, you know, let's just leave it up. The radio was just coming along, and it was handy for Marconi at the time, and today it's a great sight in Paris. But like the Crystal Palace in London, it was just a way to show off in the Industrial Age, and they fully intended to make it temporary. During this period, with the Industrial Revolution, you've got all sorts of trade, and there was a little window of time before the trains took cold that the Industrial Age canals, like the Erie Canal in the United States, were really important. Today, much of Europe is laced with Industrial Age canals, but they had that little window when they were of any value from an industry point of view, and then the ships got too big, and the train lines came, and it became more economic to go by train, and these canals were just abandoned, and today they provide Europe with a wonderful recreational sort of network, and you can take a canal boat from Amsterdam all the way to the Black Sea, if you wanted to, with canals and rivers and locks going over the Continental Divide and then down and connecting with another river and carrying out. You could take a canal from the Atlantic coast of France over the Continental Divide to the Mediterranean coast of France. And it's just a beautiful opportunity now when you're traveling to hike or bike along those canals or, and those are towpaths that used to, in the very early days, Volga boat song kind of pulling the boats up and down the canals. Uh, and you can also vacation in a canal boat in many countries in Europe. With the industrial age, we have all of these train tracks laid, and we have train stations that are just celebrating this new way to get around. And the centerpiece of a great train station facade would be a big clock, because this is the first time that clocks mattered. 
people weren't really used to looking at the minute hand, but here, with the train, you knew that quarter after, that train's leaving and it's going to be in London. And they would celebrate that by having a big clock up there. This is the triumph of the age, the industrial age. They would build all sorts of steel and glass, iron and glass buildings like Kew Gardens, like the great galleries that you find. This is the Victor Emmanuel Monument in uh, Milano, named for the first Italian king, part of this 1870 celebration of Italian unity. You've also got uh, glass and steel galleries, oh, in most cities. This is Brussels here. You see similar galleries that are wonderful, elegant, uh, turn of the century kind of shopping malls uh, in Paris and in London. The art of this period is very conformist. It's the salon sort of accepted uh, 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 romantic art. And there was a movement against this saccharine, sweet, romantic stuff and it was called realism. And when you go to Paris especially, you'll see both of these art styles side by side. This would be the pro-status quo, mainstream, no ruffled feathers, uh, conservative art from the salon. And at the same decade, you would have this, realism by Manet. This is proto-impressionism. This is realism in the sense that we're not going to make it gauzy or make anything more polite and pleasant than it really is. In this painting of Venus by Manet, we see the harsh reality of a courtesan or a prostitute, and, and she's kind of hardened, and she's been there and done that, and she's looking out at you saying, next. And it's just pretty harsh painting, and that would have been too much for the fancy people of the age in Paris, but that was the unconventional art, and that led to the uh, Impressionist movement. Impressionism is the biggest break in the flow of art since the Renaissance, when they combined art and science to give us believable three-dimensionality. Now they've mastered three-dimensionality, they've mastered realism, and with the Impressionist movement, they're leaving reality physical reality, like what we think. Impressionism is not looking at the physical thing. That's just the rack upon which the color and the shadows and the glimmers hangs. For instance, you could, take, you could stand on the balcony of your hotel, like Monet, and you could paint the cathedral from your angle at two different times of day, and it would be two different paintings, as different as a painting of a house and a car in his mind, because he doesn't care about the physical substance, he cares, about, he cares about the light and the shadow. Impressionism. A good way to illustrate that would be take Monet, the textbook impressionist, and Leonardo, textbook realist. Leonardo's driving down the street, he sees a glimmer in the asphalt ahead of you, he says, well, there's a glimmer there, but it's not there, I know, I'm gonna drive right through it, that's hard as rock, that's black. I'll paint it that way. Monet would slam the brakes, he'd jump out, he'd set up his canvas, and he'd capture the glimmer on the asphalt, because he's looking for the impression of the light and the shadow at that particular moment. The rallying cry of the Impressionists was out of the studio and into nature. They wanted to get out and set up their canvas and capture that moment. Impressionism was named as an insult, just a scant impression, but I think that suited them well. It was not pausing long enough to get the actual number of leaves and so on. That didn't matter. We're catching the ambience of that beautiful moment with the dappled life, light as the sun is shining through the willows. Monet, the great Impressionist, actually dedicated a good part of his life to making this wonderful garden outside of Paris at Giverny. And when you go to Giverny today, you wander through the lily pads and under the weeping willows and over the little Japanese bridge, and you see all of these uh, beautiful, inspirational scenes, and then you go to the gallery and you see how it just inspired Monet. It's an amazing thing. And Impressionists, remember, it, it happened to coincide with the uh, popularization of the camera. I think it's a little simplistic to say the camera could do reality so painters left it, but having the camera there didn't encourage painters to labor over reality. I think they were inspired to go beyond reality. They were kind of freed now to get into that uh, wonderful catch the moment. Impressionists do not mix the, the painting on the palette. They dab the colors side by side, knowing it will mix as it comes to your eyes, and that gives it a special kind of vibrancy. 
The key about Impressionism, of course, is not to get up too close. You don't want to stand really close and say, aren't those messy, messy brush strokes? You want to step back and let the moment, the ambience, the conviviality turn you on. This is Renoir, and this is a garden party in Paris. And here we have that swirling, romantic, everybody's had two glasses of wine and there's wonderful music and we're getting along just fine moment. It's a beautiful painting. And thank goodness it's not bogged down to details. You're caught up in the impression of it. The greatest impressionism is in Paris. You'll find it in the Orsay Gallery. Remember, the art until about 1850 is all in the Louvre. And then after the Louvre, you've got the collection of all the other galleries in Paris gathered together in the uh, Orsay Gallery. A former train station almost met the wrecking ball. Today, it is one of the most delightful artistic experiences you could have in Europe. Don't miss the Orsay Gallery for the post-Louvre paintings and statues in Paris. Now, with the Impressionist movement, that's the last time artists were all held together. From this point, it just goes crazy. And I have a real hard time with 20th century art making sense of a lot of the different movements. And uh, we'll just talk a little bit about some strange through the 20th century. When we look at the, 19, the 18th century and the 19th century, so far what we've talked about is in the 1900s, or in the 1800s, we got nationalism as a driving force. This is opened up when you start, remember when you have the Habsburgs, they're ruling people that speak all different languages, regardless of what their language is. They're just ruling it because so-and-so married so-and-so, and now they inherited that realm, and there's no togetherness. The modern idea is you have a national movement that rules itself. That's nationalism big time in the 19th century. We've got the Industrial Revolution, and along with that Industrial Age architecture, that whole erector set stuff, in a moment we're going to see Art Nouveau, which is organic, leafy, curvy, intentionally swoopy kind of art that is a reaction against the Industrial Age art. Too much Eiffel Tower, too much T-square, give me a little Art Nouveau. We got Romanticism leading to Realism, which leads to Impressionism, and then we get into the 20th century. The Victorian era, when we think of the word Victorian era, that's just the time of Queen Victoria in England, who ruled for, I think, 60 or 70 years. I mean, it was a very long reign, and that was most of the 19th century, and the nationalism, and romanticism, and so on. Okay, into the modern age, post-impressionism, Van Gogh is one of the most important painters you'll find. Van Gogh was from the Netherlands. Van Gogh, this is a self-portrait, was a very spiritual painter. Uh, as a young man, he even wanted to be a pastor. He worked with poor people, and he painted poor people with a special affinity. Here are the potato eaters you feel that Van Gogh has an empathy for these salt-of-the-earth peasants and farmers. It shows in his beautiful art. When you look at the explosion of life and color and everything breathing together in a Van Gogh painting, you understand his spiritual look at the world. It's all one. It's all kind of God in our face. And it's a beautiful, powerful sort of thing. He moved down to the south of France. He had an explosion of creative activity. He couldn't handle it all. And you've probably, you know, about Van Gogh's life and his tragic end. He ended up killing himself in a wheat field. This is one of his last paintings. And we see ominous crows taking flight in a wheat field and that was uh, right at the end of Van Gogh's life. I mentioned Art Nouveau. Art Nouveau, around the turn of the 19, the, about the year 1900, Art Nouveau is organic. It is slinky. It is an intentional reaction against the stern erector set art of the industrial age. I love Art Nouveau. It's just so easy to like Art Nouveau. It's really in vogue in Europe now, and you'll find Art Nouveau all over Europe when you know where to look. You've got to know the local word. You know, it's Jugendstil in German, and it's Modernisme in Spain. And uh, in, in Czech Republic, you look for the work of Alphonse Mucha. This is Mucha in Czech Republic, beautiful Art Nouveau window in the cathedral by Mucha. In Scotland, you go to Glasgow and you look for the world work of Charles Rennie Mackintosh. Very trendy, very exciting to see his work and other artists from this period in Glasgow. When you go to Catalonia, you'll find a lot of Art Nouveau. Barcelona is the capital of Catalonia, and here the most enjoyable Art Nouveau artist is probably Anthony Gaudí. 
Gaudí is famous for his Sagrada Familia church. You know, I'm, in the Middle Ages, they would take two centuries to build a church well beyond the lifespan of any of the people working on it at the start when it was finally finished. In a way, that's the Sagrada Familia in Barcelona. It's been going for 100 years, and it's getting there now. I've been visiting it for 30 years, and it's so exciting to see the process. If there's one building I'd like to see finished in Europe, if there's one building I'd like to see in Europe, it's the Sagrada Familia finished in Barcelona. Here we can see this organic church, and you pay a steep admission to go there, but that's contributing to the ongoing construction costs, so it feels good to pay the admission. And now the church is actually consecrated. It's got a roof over its head. I remember filming there with hard hats on, and now you can go to mass right in that church under this beautiful organic roof. When you think about Art Nouveau, look at the columns here. That is organic. These remind you of bamboo shoots. Gaudí is inspired by nature to have this canopy over the top of that beautiful church. And you can visit that today. A classic example of Art Nouveau architecture in Barcelona. At the dawn of World War I, we see Europe here. And here we have the Austro-Hungarian Empire and German Empire. We've got Serbia in the southern part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. We've got the Ottoman Empire, the old man of Europe, it's called. We've got Russia ready for revolution. Italy is united. France and Germans have really never even met each other yet. There has not been much travel, so they can go to work, battle on the Western Front and end up slaughtering each other. You've got, in 1914, the Archduke going from Vienna down to Sarajevo to let it be known that the Habsburgs are going to keep a strict rule down here. We're going to have like military exercises next week, and we want you guys to toe the line. Even though we don't speak your language, we don't really care about you guys. You're part of this empire. And then one of their radicals, you could call him a terrorist, you could call him an anarchist, you could call him a patriot, I don't know, but he killed the Archduke because he wanted Serbia to be free. And uh, what happened after that was there was a whole conflicting, complicated pile of treaties that were misunderstood and that were inconsistent and that were overlapping. And when Serbia assassinated the heir to the throne of the Habsburgs, Russia supported Serbia because they were both Slavs. Germany supported Austria because they had to blank check a support. When Germany supported Austria against Serbia and Russia, France jumped in because it was tied in with Russia, and Germany decided to invade France. All of that happened just boom, 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 like a chain reaction after Princep killed Ferdinand in Sarajevo, of all godforsaken places. I mean, it's amazing that that isolated incident would cause Germany to invade France. That was the first thing that happened. Germany invaded France. By the end of it, untold slaughter, all the royal families were gone, and Europe was into a brave new world. It was amazing how much slaughter happened. The, the military leaders of the First World War were the heroes of wars back in the late 1800s who had no understanding of the power of the new weapons. The machine gun was brand new. They called it the peacemaker back then in 1914 because it was so overwhelming and brutal that nobody could ever send their troops into it. It would guarantee peace. But the leaders of the previous war had no idea of the power of that. They'd wave their shoulders, swords, and boys would climb out of the trenches into the machine gun fire. By, by the end of World War I, half of all the men in France between 15 and 30 were casualties. Half of all the men. It's amazing. It's amazing. The more you read about it, and you can visit sites about that in your travels. This obviously shook up the whole cultural scene, and you've got expressionist art coming out of this harsh new modern age. Uh, Monk's work is a good example of expressionism, but this is art that's just been shaken up from a society that's just been shaken up, and nothing is like it was in the old days. It's an amazing new age in the 20th century. Picasso is one of the great painters of our, uh, the last century. Uh, he was there in many, many styles, and I like Picasso's early art because in Picasso's early art, you can see an abstract artist that is classically trained. And this is a very important reminder that the abstract artists that confuse a lot of us are classically trained. Picasso did this as a little teenager, 
And from that, he would evolve into Cubism, and Picasso helped establish the whole genre of Cubism. Cubism is, the best way I could understand Cubism is, you take something that you can understand. Here's a vase, and you break it, and you then glue all of the shards onto a wall. And there you can see all the sides of it in different arrangement, and you play with your perspective. Cubism lets you play with your perspective in an unconventional way. Picasso also did Guernica, which is sort of the national piece of art in Europe in a lot of ways, which is a cubist collage. And this is, to me, a powerful statement for peace, a powerful statement about the humanity of, quote, collateral damage. When France, when, when Spain was having its civil war, the fascist Franco was fighting uh, against the uh, forces for uh, democracy, and Hitler was allied with Franco, because they're both fascists. Hitler was anticipating World War II. He had airplanes that were really clever at dropping bombs, something that was quite innovative. And he told Franco, if you'd like, I could practice a little bit on some of your enemies, and I'd like to see how my bombs work anyways. Franco said, I am just so disgusted with the Basques who are helping the enemy in my civil war. Why don't you bomb their historic, precious, ancestral capital? Guernica. So Hitler sent his Luftwaffe down there, and during market day, early in the morning when everybody was out, the airplanes came in and just brutalized the town. It was horrific, and it was sort of an inkling of the, of the uh, destructive power of World War II, which was just around the corner. The world was just appalled at this. Picasso stopped what he was doing, and he created Guernica, which was not allowed in Spain until Franco was dead. And today it sets in a place of honor in Madrid, and you got to see it when you're in Madrid, Picasso's masterpiece, Guernica. And when you look at this, you really are looking at the reality of aerial bombardments and collateral damage, which humanizes that understanding of war. Picasso finished his career in the south of France. I like to see his early work in um, Barcelona, because that's where he grew up, and his best early work is there. And then the new Picasso Museum has just reopened in Paris, which would be his later art, and a wonderful museum filled with Picasso in Antibes, in the south of France. In Antibes, you've got this famous painting, The, the Joy of Life, the Joie de Vivre. And uh, this reminds me of Picasso's famous quote. He said, as a child, I learned to paint as an adult. And finally, as an adult, I learned to paint as a child. And when you look at the playful love of life in Picasso's last work, then you really understand, I think, what Picasso is all about. Now, a big art movement in the same period is surrealism. S Salvador Dali is the famous surrealist. You'll see surreal art all over Europe. It's very trendy and popular, and you see lots of galleries that like to make money selling tickets to their surrealistic art. The key about surrealism, and you'll see it in every art, ga art gallery, in, modern art gallery in Europe, is don't try to look for meaning. There's no, what did the artist mean by this? The artist is intentionally giving you a dreamscape, and whatever you make of it is the, is the correct answer. This is ring bars for your mind. Just lose yourself in the surreal image that they've given you. These are dreamscapes, and these are gorgeous. And these are beautiful and fun to see and enjoy in modern art galleries. Now, when you think about abstract art, I have a real struggle with abstract art from a conventional painting point of view, but I don't have any struggle with it in other ways. I love to look at a sunset. I love to look at formations of clouds blowing over the mountains. I love beautiful patterns in nature. But when I look at a canvas, I want to know, what am I supposed to see? We've got to free ourselves from that. If we want to appreciate abstract art from the 20th century, we've got to assume the man who painted this was classically trained. He could do a dog sitting on top of a car. That would be easy. He's going beyond that now. This is, this is thoughtful going beyond the hang-up of reality. Let me give you an example of how we might be comfortable our ears with um, uh, uh, abstract, and we might be more comfortable with our eyes with abstract. Audioly, some of us are fine with beautiful tones and so on. Other of us need to be grounded in a scale. I really like a scale. I'm tonal, just like I am needing of reality in a visual image. Franz Liszt, the great piano player, 
really had a powerful need for tonality, the sort of opposite of abstract when it comes to music. In fact, he was so needy of tonality that his wife knew how to wake up the great pianist and composer Franz Liszt by singing or playing on the piano the first seven notes of a scale. In early in the morning, she would sing Do, Re, Mi, Fa, So, La, Ti. <laughs> Franz Liszt couldn't handle it. He'd get out of bed, Do. You see, that's tonality. I need that. I can't do it abstract. Other people can get beyond that. I think our need for visual reality is similar to Franz Liszt's need for tonality. If we can break beyond that, then we can enjoy a painting like this. But that's our challenge. Can you listen to a song without having to go back to the root chord? Can you listen to a song without having to know what's it supposed to mean? Can you enjoy a canvas with the same approach? A big part of your sightseeing in Europe is 20th century architecture. And in the 20th century, architecture gets really radical simply by going form follows function. It needs to be functional. And this was really oppressive to the status quo. As a matter of fact, this very avant-garde uh, building by a guy named Guido Loos faces the Habsburg Palace in Vienna. And here we have the epitome of the modern world. Modern, forward-looking, nothing ornate, certainly no royalty, facing the palace of everything that symbolized the old school. And the Habsburgs were so angry with this building they decreed that it must put flower boxes under the windows, just so it would have a little bit of decor. The bold new world didn't need flower boxes. It didn't need curly cues. Form follows function. Fascism really left its mark in Europe in a lot of destructive ways and in a few constructive ways. Mussolini had time to leave his mark on Rome before World War II started. And here we have Mussolini's futuristic planned suburb, EUR. It's really fun to go out to EUR and get a little look at fascism. Fascism is violent, melodramatic, neo-pagan, extreme patriotism. Everybody in lockstep, there's no questions asked. This is all for one and one for all. Either you're with us or against us, that kind of stuff. And it's clenched fists, it's purity, it's the whole society in unison. Wow. You see that in Hitler's drawings. You see that in Hitler's dreams. You see that in Mussolini's remnants of his vision in Rome. Go to EUR and see a little bit of that fascist, scary future. Also at the same time, you've got communism and Bolshevikism and the Soviet Union. And we've got Karl Marx, we've got Engels, we've got Lenin, we've got Stalin as sort of the, the gods of that movement. And the art of communism is called socialist realism. We all know what censorship is. Socialist realism takes censorship beyond our vision of censorship. I would think censorship is, you can't do that if it challenges me. No. In communism, you can't do it unless it supports me. You see, you can't make that art unless it actively supports the ideology. That's a huge difference than you just can't do innocuous stuff. The great Soviet composers, uh, Stravinsky and so on, they were hamstrung by not being able to make beautiful music unless it stirred the right emotions so people would embrace the ideology of communism. That's socialist realism. When we look at the art of socialist realism, it's supporting the latest Stalin five-year plan. It's easy, it's got a slogan, it can be reprinted, it can hang <clears throat> in every uh, factory wall. In Berlin, you can see some murals that are left over from communism, and these are all singing the joys of the communist society. All the workers are heroic, all the mothers are heroic, all the children are going to school and gonna embrace the ideology. It's quite exciting art. As you travel around the former communist world, you can also go to museums that shows anti-system art that was coming about during the fall of communism when they were satirizing all the problems in society, like the long lines people waned in. 
And also, when you go to Eastern Europe today, you can find collections of statues that used to keep the people down. Outside of Budapest, there's a statue park where they've gathered together all the socialist realist statues, and they're sort of in this bizarre little circle dance, ranting and raving about either each other in a kind of surrealistic way, instead of on the main squares keeping the people down. But the people didn't melt down those statues. They brought them together in this park, and today they look back on it with a little bit of nostalgia. Remember, much of Europe was destroyed in World War II. Germany laid in ruins, and the big question then was, how do you rebuild your cities? German cities got together in the late 1940s, and they had to decide, do we want the Manhattan Plan, or do we want the medieval plan? You could rebuild it in your medieval style like Munich did, and here you see parts of Munich that were bombed flat, old medieval walls and gates that are built up in what feels like on the cheap reconstructions from the years after the war, because that's what it was. Or you can go to Frankfurt and find a city that was just as bombed out, but it was rebuilt on the Manhattan plan. Frankfurt is all skyscrapers, because they just wanted to move boldly into the future and take this chance to rebuild without the shackles of that cute medieval plan that, of its origins. You got great churches that were completely blown out, and they've rebuilt today in a way where they've gathered once beautiful medieval windows and put it into a modern collage with little shards of their medieval heritage there in the windows of that modern post-World War II church. This is the great Frauenkirk in Dresden, and for years, all of Western art levels were lovers were contributing funds to rebuild it, and today, the city of Dresden, which suffered the firestorm in World War II, is uh, rebuilt and looking quite nice. Very interesting to see the rebuilt cities after the war. Remember, this is the main square in Frankfurt. Here you can see, look at all those uniform windows. Anytime you see uniform windows in what looks like a medieval building, it's not a medieval building because you couldn't buy a dozen uniform windows back then. You would have a more higgly-piggly ad-lib design, but here you've got that uniformity indicating that it was rebuilt after bombs in the war. All over Europe, they're protecting the facade, so we have a nice homogenous view from the street, but behind those facades, they're building modern buildings. So you'll see the old facades, but don't think that means there's old buildings behind them. They just save the facades and rebuild modern. Berlin has woven itself back together after terrible destruction in the war, and then it was divided with the Cold War, and it had the Berlin Wall. A, a generation ago, if you crossed the street, they'd shoot you because that was the Berlin Wall. Today, there's almost no indication of where the Berlin Wall once stood, and the city is woven back together. Beautiful, modern governmental buildings in Berlin. This is the new Reichstag Dome that you'll see when you go to Berlin. All over Europe, this generation, you're finding cutting-edge architecture. This is the new BMW showroom and museum in Munich. Here we have the Arc of the Defense, rather than the Arc de Triomphe, in Paris. It's a huge arch, as big as the Notre Dame could fit under it in Paris, and this celebrates international trade on the edge of town. When you build a skyscraper in a place like France, a certain percent of your construction funds has to be dedicated to modern art, and that would be in the plaza where the people are outside, and I'm impressed by the people friendliness of all of these new developments. All over Europe, you'll find that industrial wastelands that used to be the harbors are now being renovated and turned into thriving new zones. Remember, in the industrial age, they used to have big harbors right in the city, but now the huge ships can't use those harbors because they are not built on a scale for the ships. So the ships have abandoned the ports. The ports have become desolate and dangerous and run down. And then in the last generation, great cities in Europe have recognized, hey, this is where we should be building, and they've invested in those areas with great building projects like this Cinema Museum and Cinema Institute in Amsterdam, just across from the train station, like this Guggenheim Gallery of Modern Art in the industrial city of Bilbao in Basque Country, and like this Opera House in Oslo. Uh, all of these done in formerly people-unfriendly industrial wastelands. Today, the harbor fronts are being turned into parks for the people, and that's something to really enjoy. This is that new opera house in downtown Oslo. Barcelona is a good example. Barcelona had an industrial wasteland stretching along the Mediterranean coast. Today, it's been turned into beautiful beaches, a trendy uh, promenade, and all sorts of great condominiums filled with life. Hamburg, the greatest port in Germany, one third of the city was depressed and desolate. Now that's all been turned into a new zone with the centerpiece of this Philharmonie Hall, which is gonna be a collection of great concert halls and shopping malls and so on. An example of cities investing in themselves. 
as the industrial age gets more and more rusty, cities are looking at dinosaurs from all of that building and renovating them and making them fit for society today. For instance, you've got industrial age market halls all over Europe, and these are being turned into trendy food circuses. They used to be a market hall, People are going to the supermarkets now. They've still got the merchants and the farmers selling their vegetables and their fruit, but at the same time, they've invited in all sorts of trendy gourmet restaurants for a new affluent society that wants to go to the historic market hall, but also wants to have a nice restaurant there. This is the Mercado Centrale, the central market in Florence, uh, and now it's the best place to go for lunch in the city. All over Europe, I've noticed in the last year, you've got these old industrial age market halls now, fun food circuses. A big bull ring in, in Barcelona, well, they don't have bullfights there anymore. What are you going to do? Turn it into a shopping mall. Now you go to the bull ring to do your shopping when you're in Barcelona. What to do with a big wall? Turn it into an open-air art gallery. In Berlin, they've got their wall. It's still up, but this is where people go with a can of spray paint to uh, do a little political artistic venting. Industrial age cities used to be the Rust Belt. We have the Rust Belt in the United States. In Europe, there's all these second cities, uh, the Antwerps, the Hamburgs, the Liverpools, the Bilbaos, the Glasgows, and so on. These cities are now leaping into the fore as you've got trendiness, as you've got cutting edge cultural going on, as you've got great outdoor art exhibits. This is Glasgow. When you go to Glasgow, there's all sorts of beautiful open air art. I think it's important to remember to give those second cities, the Marseilles, the Portos, the Bilbaos, a hard look because there's lots happening there. When you're in Edinburgh, it's just a 45 minute train ride to Glasgow, and in a lot of ways, Glasgow is more happening now than Edinburgh, believe it or not. Europe is changing, Europe is fun, Europe is stimulating, and art is for the people today. And when we travel through Europe, it is just so fun to have an appetite for what went on to shape the societies we're going to be visiting. How can we better appreciate the art, and how can we get the most out of every mile, minute, and dollar in our travels? Every country in Europe has great local artists featured, like this Carl Millis garden in Stockholm. Do your planning. Know what cities have what sites available, and remember, the more you understand the art, whether it's medieval art or Renaissance art or avant-garde art, the more you understand it, the more you know who paid for it and why, the more you know what was going on during that period, I think the more rewarding that sightseeing will be. I hope this gives you a good sense of modern art, and I want to wish you happy travels, and thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.